It is my great privilege and honor to uh, have Miriam with us today. Uh, she's a serial entrepreneur. She's done this uh, multiple times successfully. Uh, she has also uh, uh, experienced in both the first internet boom and whatever we call the current thing we're in. <laughs> the <laughs> right. endless things. <laughs> right. Uh, and, you know, has been on various lists, you know, fortune, most powerful uh, women entrepreneurs, et cetera, et cetera, blah, lists. Uh, and, um, but, you know, one of the uh, part of the design of this was, as you noted last week, we actually had something of a notion that one of the ways that uh, even small startups can actually blitz scale and scale very quickly is through the deployment of communities. And it's one of the things that Merriam has done very successfully within the commercial realm. And so we thought that that was another part of the interesting arc, especially when you're dealing with the, uh, you know, essentially the tribe stage of what kinds of things uh, could be very relevant. So um, why don't we just very quickly touch on kind of the first business, mm -hmm. Eve, right? Mm -hmm. Eve.com. You know, yes, exactly. Uh, what got you into it? How many employees did you get to? What was a little bit of the kind of the story of the mm -hmm. first internet boom and yeah. kind of what what lessons did you learn from it that you carried forward? So I was on the Stanford campus uh, in the basement of the Stanford, the GSB building on a payphone. Believe it or not, no cell phone. <laughs> so I was actually using the payphone. And I was calling a best friend of mine in New York and saying, come out with me, there's venture capital money available, I've been through banking, I've been through consulting, there's no way I'm going to progress to these ranks, I've got to work for myself, I'm not interviewing for any jobs, uh, so come start a business with me. She was my roommate while we were in banking together, Varsha Rao, and uh, she said, I'll come out there, I'll leave McKinsey, I'll move in into your tiny little apartment and sleep on your couch, but only if we start what I want to start, which is this online cosmetics business. And I wanted to do um, online uh, uh, market research. I, like, I love market research and data and surveys and stuff. But I said, sure, you know, I use cosmetics. How hard can it be? You know, I don't know anything about it. We might as well start you. So, so that was a very different time. It was 98. Um, we went out and raised, in the first year and a half, $26 million. We were 20, I think I was 28. 20, yeah, 28, and um, we built it really fast because it was really a land grant mentality. It was, you know, who's going to get mind share in the consumer's mind first as the first online cosmetics destination? It's a, it's a, it's, it's, and it was a very simple business now that I think about it because you, well, you had to go convince all the brands to give you distribution, put it in a warehouse, pick and pack it, and make sure all consumers understood that you were the destination for online cosmetics. And we grew it very rapidly, 120 people, six months. I think we hired the entire uh, executive team in six months, and, and 120 people. And all of a sudden, we're in the middle of, we're on Market Street with this fancy office, and, and they're, you know, like, it's like a 10-person board, Bill Gross from Idea Lab, a bunch mm -hmm. of other people. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, Sephora, LVMH approached us to buy us within... I think before we even launched, they wanted to get us out of there because they were trying to launch Sephora in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they were really concerned about us. So they tried to buy us before we launched. We said, look, we're just trying to launch this business. Mm -hmm. just, so they literally tried to uh, buy us the month before we launched, then the month after we launched, and finally in December, tried again. And we thought, okay, well, we're, we're, at this point, we're just nine months into it. We're rising a Series D. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. this is the craziness of the environment. Uh -huh. And we, we noticed that it was starting to get a little hard. This is a early 2000, so this is about a, a year after we launched. We spent about a year building it. We launched early 2000, they say, uh, we said, you know, they say we want to buy you, and we thought, okay, it's getting a little harder to raise a Series D. People are starting to ask about profitability, <laughs> and um, that. yeah, fancy <laughs> that. So we thought uh, maybe we should seriously talk to them. We start going down the path. They want to buy us for 88 million dollars. We thought, I thought, you know, this is pretty good. We should sell the company because we need to be under the aegis of a, of a bigger player and get the con, con, the, 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 the dedicated distribution rights from brands. Mm -hmm. um, Varsha agreed. But then Idea Lab stepped forward and said, you know, um, not sure about this valuation of 88 million. We just told Goldman Sachs you're worth, you know, 300 million. And so I, all of a sudden, I guess as a, a very uh, presumptuous 28-year-old, said, well, if you, if you don't like the price, then you should pay more. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then that's what happened. So we sold it to Idea Lab for over $100 million in cash in April 2000. And two weeks later, the NASDAQ plunged. <laughs> um, and I got my first gray hair 
seriously uh, got started getting gray hair about that time because the merger had not been approved yet. And uh, there was all kinds of things that happened during that process. Needless to say, the deal stuck together. We managed to hold the deal together. Um, I stayed on with the acquire with Idea Lab. Uh, we launched a whole bunch of Idea Lab companies into the into Eve.com, and then uh, finally we resold it to Sephora in October 2000. So we sold it twice in about ten, six months, something like that. Yeah. So that's part one. That's the first entrepreneurial experience. Uh, and before we move on, so one is if you were to call yourself, like your, mm -hmm. your current self sitting here, you were able to talk to your younger self just oh, starting. I wish I could. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what are the key things you would tell yourself about how to run that race differently? Like what, or, or what to emphasize and what to detract? Um, I would have tried to think a little bit longer term mm -hmm. because when the company, so Ideal had run into issues where it couldn't go out. It was about to go public. Goldman was trying to take them out. Then the market fell apart, so they couldn't go public. So they wanted to shut us down. And they said, Mariam, can you sell the business again for us? So mm -hmm. I, I, turned, I turned around, picked up the phone, called LVMH. But in retrospect, there was something else I could have done, which is taken the money out of my pocket and bought it for a tenth of what I had been paid, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I could have bought the whole thing back. Yep. Two million uniques a month in traffic already after one year. Uh -huh. yep. But, you know, when you are, I, I would say to myself, uh, if you're, when you're young and you're going through, like, all of a sudden the Great Depression, you have this tendency to become conservative. And when everything starts falling apart around you, every single day there's a company going under and the entire world is imploding, mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to have the historical context. And if, maybe if I had been a better study, student of history, I would have realized that the internet was indeed not over. <laughs> <laughs> and it was not time to leave town, uh, but it, it, you know, I would have bought it back myself. That's what I would have done. Yeah, but there was two years of winter, right? Maybe even three or four. Right? Yeah. So that would have been a... Very bold choice. It would have been a bold choice. And I was, I was severely in debt when I graduated yeah. from the business school. I was able to you know, pay off my debts. I, you know, <clears throat> like nobody in my family came from a business background. Mm -hmm. So for me, this was like the sale was a big triumph. You know? yeah. and, so, and it put me in a very different place in life. So I, um, I had a hard time thinking, I'll put my cash back in again now. Mm -hmm. So I, I did get a little conservative. And I've been fighting that ever since. So, let, so one thing you would have done is say, I suppose the selling at Sephora actually, in fact, a belief in the internet and the macro counter being contrarian, mm -hmm. I would have actually bought it back and built from it because actually, in fact, the asset was a unique asset. Yeah. That actually, something could make something of. And totally. I, I would have tried to figure out, and now I know how to make businesses profitable. Mm -hmm. I did not know for sure then how to do it, yep. but I learned it afterwards going to a bigger company. I went to a bigger company for a couple of years to really learn how to make, to run a PL. Yep. And um, now realize I could have probably done it with, because we were already doing about 10 million in sales on an annual run rate. Mm -hmm. um, yep in their first year. So it's a lot of what, if, what ifs and could have, should haves. But I mean, I think the idea is to be a little bit less conservative when you're, I would have been a little less conservative. And uh, what about other lessons like financing pattern, mm -hmm. hiring patterns, yeah. go to market patterns? Yeah. Anything of those from the... From the yes. From the, yeah. <laughs> uh, so one thing was I didn't like the size of the board being so large at the mm -hmm. beginning and all the board members, uh, some of them didn't get along that well. <clears throat> so... It was, you know, I spent about 25... That's probably code for terribly, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. No comment. Uh, yes. <laughs> so there were, there were board members who didn't agree. There were two board members from the Series B fighting over one board seat all the time, trying to, like, uh, kind of gain favors with mm -hmm. us to try to give them the, the board seat. Mm -hmm. um, then, uh, you know, we spent about 20% of our time managing the board, which I thought was wasted time. Mm -hmm. I just thought, you know... I need to focus all my time right now on building this company. I have I work till ten o'clock every night in the office. I mean, I don't have time to spare to build, to, to you know to manage the board, and getting someone a pashmina scarf, etc. It's, it's a long story, but uh, <laughs> it's it's a very long story. So um, I thought I thought okay, small board, maybe back away from VC financing quite so early. Um, and it was very much the, uh, but you know, on the other hand, I, I got to see what a lot of capital buys you, the best PR firm, the best mm -hmm. executives, the best headhunters. I, I could see, I learned on somebody else's dime, really. Mm -hmm. And that's what made it possible to do Minted in a completely different way, which is yeah. I raised uh, 11 million for seven years of operation and brought yeah. to break even. Yeah. Um, and that was a very, and for, you know, a commerce company that makes things. <laughs> and so that, that was a very, very different capital and financing strategy. And I would not have, I don't think, been able to do that had I, and also actually known how to scale now. 
Mm. Because now we're going into the big, we've raised the big yeah. capital, we raised 90 million now for Minted, and uh, we're definitely in the range of like, you know, hiring the more expensive executives yeah. and all of that. Mm -hmm. yep. And I wouldn't have seen how to do it had I not done it the first time with Eve. So it's, it's a little, you know. I may come back and ask you a couple more questions about Eve, but because that is actually literally, you've softball, you, you've literally teed up what was the next question after Eve. Let's, uh -huh. let's do that now, which yeah. is, you know, one of the key things that is kind of be a theme throughout the quarter for the students is choosing when to blitz scale. It isn't like success equals blitz scale, failure equals not blitz scale. Mm -hmm. You know, part of what we did in the very beginning when we were portraying LinkedIn is we said, look, it was this very long period where we were just getting it right before we actually mm -hmm. did that. And actually making that decision about when do you pour on the gas and then how do you do it is actually one of the really key things. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the first part of Minted, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, okay, let me be capital efficient. Let me raise $7 million or mm -hmm. 11 or whatever. 11, you, yeah. Yes. The, and go for seven years, go through that. And then now is the time. And this is the reason. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I thought that uh, I had some, you know, lifestyle considerations. So in the beginning, I, I had just had my second child, so I wanted to really control the pace myself. Mm -hmm. The second, you know, so I, what 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 Eve bought me was credibility and being able to make investors a return. And with that, I had a lot of choices, career choices, and I could afford a lot of um, like support. For example, I could have a family. I could basically have everything. I could have my family and have a career. And that was really great. So I think getting out of the gates early with a taking a risk really paid off for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I would encourage people to think about that early. Um, mm -hmm. yep. But um, so basically, uh, you know, I guess with 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 minted, um, I wanted to basically control the pace. I was worried about people getting in the way of the strategy when the strategy wasn't quite solidified. So when I raised angel financing, people weren't quite necessarily on board with crowdsourcing 100% among our angels. They were thinking crowdsourcing sounds interesting, but maybe crowdsourcing is nothing. You know, mm -hmm. who knows what crowdsourcing is going to do, do, do. So sign up all these brands, go with a brand strategy, sign up a one, it was a web 1.0 strategy of building distribution rights with existing stationary brands, believe it or not, that we did in addition to trying to build the crowdsourcing mechanism. And so I wanted to have the flexibility to really change the model quite dramatically without having to take 10 people with me around on those strategic meanderings. So that was another thing. Third, so there keep was the, the team small for agility. Agility, agility yeah. and communication is everything, right? Yeah. So if you have to communicate to 10 board members versus one or two, it's yeah. just a completely different proposition. And I really believe in keeping people uh, updated along the way so there are no surprises. So yeah. I really try to bring people along. Um, third, there wasn't a lot of competition. Nobody was talking about crowdsourcing, really, and nobody was talking about stationary. So yeah. I didn't really have to worry. It wasn't the Eve.com situation where we were in this like land grab where the minute we launched four other VC-backed firms launched, companies launched uh, behind us into the cosmetics market. There was, I mean, I know you guys probably don't remember this, but there was Gloss.com and uh, I don't know, all, all, lots of companies that, names I don't even remember now. <laughs> uh, four, five of us all launched and we were the first by a month, maybe mm -hmm. a month and a half, and then there were four behind us. So that was an example of trying to grab mind share in consumers' minds as this is the number one first destination for cosmetics online uh -huh. yep. and spending money to make sure you yep. everybody knew that, right? Yep. Minted, it was like, nope, no one was circling at all, so I could yep. take my time. Yep. So I had the luxury of no competition. Yep. Yep. Um, so those were some of the decisions. When we finally started to, your, I think your question is, well, what then made us finally do it? Yep. Well, we, we, we always imagined... Actually, talk yeah, a little bit about sure. also your idea for starting it, because... Mm -hmm. You know, as a yeah. formerly serious, uh, you know, successful entrepreneur, you're not going to start something unless you think it can be big. Yeah. You know, in that big thing, you think, okay, we're going to go run tight for a while, you know, but I do plan to get big. So it wasn't like, no, 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 or planning. Yes, there is like, look, I'd like to have some control over my life. Mm -hmm. But if it's just going to be like, if you, if, if you, if mm -hmm. it had been a lifestyle business for you, mm -hmm. you would have been like, no, <laughs> no thanks. Right. But I'm trying to do something. So what was the thinking about, oh, this one actually, in fact, will have that kind of, lengthy ramp was there certain hypotheses you wanted to yeah. test what was the yeah answer? well so i've been a lifelong shopper i'll admit it right now when i wasn't doing my homework at school i was always in the mall and my parents would always criticize me for it and then i, I would but i would go there and think 
geez, you know, first this brand is hot, then this brand is not, you know, and I actually really, um, for example, respect Mickey Drexler at Gap as being, well, he used to be at Gap, now J. Crew is this great merchant, but even he can have a bad couple of years. So what I really wanted to do was uh, figure out a way to build a retail brand that would last forever, that would be fresh forever. And the way I thought you could do that is by completely removing the risk associated with a couple people choosing the merchandise. Because what if those couple people are wrong and what if they have a bad year? So the hypothesis was, and I'm still completely obsessed with this hypothesis because oh, yeah. I'm trying to see how far I can take it, um, is if you turn all the decisions over to the crowd and you let people submit and curate, you will be f potentially fresh forever. And mm -hmm. what if I? T and it was a completely a, a complete hypothesis. And I mm -hmm. thought I would start in stationery, which Peter Fenton, one of our backers, now says uh, I brought a gun to a knife fight <laughs> because. We figured out how to do crowdsourcing of design, and we brought it to the stationery business, you know, so yes. a broader market. Yes. And the stationery market is a $10 billion market. Yes. It's not that large. Um, um, but I did it because I wanted to start in a small place where I could have very little competition, really revolutionize design completely. And then I love the econo unit economics, high average transaction value, high margins, inherent virality of the product, which we can talk about in the marketing thing, yep. inherent virality, um, huge... Um, huge repeat factor, great customers that repeat with you if you're loyal. So once you get them, you have you can sell them other things, they repeat with you, you've built something. Yep. So uh, I started there, but then when I, um, with this hypothesis that we could, um, that we would um, build a, just a stationary retailer that was crowdsourced and see if we could do something big with that market. But then in 2011, 12, realized that we weren't a stationary retailer at all. We had built a community of independent creatives who were not stationary designers at all. <laughs> and I can talk more about that, but that's when yeah, I realized we, we would take the capital. Yeah. And that's, that's when the, 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 the scaling of the capital started. Got it. Yeah. And the theory of the scale capital to scale the business was? Uh, we needed... Or is? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, it is it it is that uh, we could no longer do the cheap thing of having a couple of us do all the executive jobs if we mm -hmm. really wanted to grow ourselves into a several hundred million, several billion dollar company uh, and address different markets. Yep. So, yeah. if you were advancing the burn rate, were you advancing the burn rate on building the organization? You'd be advancing the burn rate on recruiting a bunch of new people within the design community? I see. Uh, it was all people inside the company. We were mm -hmm. a very product-driven company. We spend very little on marketing. Mm -hmm. And so it was all you know, building engineering, building an executive team out uh, mm -hmm. to run the different groups, different departments. I was basically, before that, uh, basically playing maybe four or five VP roles myself. Mm -hmm. um, same with my co-founder, who I recruited right out of Stanford. Uh -huh. uh, so I recruited a co-founder who was about seven to 10 years younger than me, mm -hmm. right out of the GSB. Um, and um, we each split all the VP roles up in the beginning. That's <laughs> how we got, to, we got to cash flow break even in 2012, uh -huh. basically because we didn't hire a lot of expensive executives. Yep. But then we realized that that wasn't gonna scale to, um, to a larger business or to more verticals. So we went from art we went to state. Uh, sorry, we went uh, from stationery into art. We we sell wall art now, wall art prints. We started in 2012. We launched fabrics by the yard last year, yeah. and this year we moved into home decor. So we now sell home decor like pillows, lampshades, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, made on demand for you out of all these crowdsourced designs. So we moved progressively into more and more verticals. And so let's think a little bit about that move. Let, let's ex expose a little bit about the move in verticals. Mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. part of. Like there's two parts of the scaling thesis that you've exemplified. One mm -hmm. part of it is, okay, how do we really build up the employees in order to capture a much larger market opportunity and to do that at some speed mm -hmm. in order to occupy to get the critical mass, et cetera. Right. Second part of it is let's also deploy like sometimes it's software developers on, you know, like an iOS platform or something else, or but let's deploy a community to yes. also add a lot of value into the ecosystem. Yeah. So when you're making a decision to go you know, like, okay, so we were stationary. Oh, and in case you guys missed that, the word that is obviously way overused in Silicon Valley, but is disrupt, <laughs> right, yeah. in terms of disrupting the, yeah. the, the, the stationary business. And also it's kind of the classic zero to one thesis of, of like, okay, let's tackle something that we know we can, we have a, we don't know, we have a very good bet of killing. And then mm -hmm. once we have that, mm -hmm. then we can actually, in fact, broaden up. Yeah. How did your thinking go to now is the time these are the verticals, we're gonna do it as a multiple vertical strategy, and how did that all play in the community? Right, so um, 
we did a, we did what we thought were small experiments, and we ran everything. In, at Minted is a competition. You run competitions. People enter the competitions from all over the world. There are no qualifications needed. All you do is upload a JPEG. That's it. And then if you win, you give us the original file. We sell it. You make a great commission, and everyone is happy. And a, and a cat, upfront cash prize that you get to keep. Um, and people vote, and everyone is invited to vote. Um, when um, we decided to move into art, we decided to just try one art challenge. And I decided to take the furthest away thing, the most challenging thing I could possibly do, just to kind of see, can the community produce pe art that people want to put on their walls? Because that's very different from producing a piece of stationery. However, the supply chain is about the same. I can use the same supply chain, because I didn't mention to you that we make everything, too. So once we source the file, we have all these integrated partnerships and we send, out the, uh, we send out files to the printers, and the printers mm -hmm. drop ship. So I could leverage the same supply chain back end, right? Mm -hmm. but go very far to see how far we could stretch the community, the same community. Um, it worked. Within mm -hmm. three months, we had West Elm calling us, a retailer owned by William Sonoma, to say, we want your art in all of our stores. That was the first sign it was working, mm -hmm. was when the people in the know start calling you and saying, we need this content. Because mm -hmm. yes. ultimately, Minted is a content destination. Yes. We make content. We just happen to monetize it by selling it in physical form to you. We're going to sell it in digital form starting about a week from now. We're going to launch digital invitations. To, you know, so we'll, we'll be competing with Paperless Post and Evite in about a week. Is that OK to be on video camera? Or is that confidential? Um, uh, it's fine. Or I think. we could delay the, the, the yeah, release of this video. Yeah, sure, okay, sure. Okay. Yeah. It be delayed by about a week. Okay, but perfect. So that's okay. about. Yes. It. So don't tweet that. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yes. Yeah. So we're gonna. We're you know we we're agnostic actually about whether we monetize the content either physically or digitally. Mm -hmm. We don't really care in the end. It's like whatever you want to do to create, bring style and design to your life is great with us. So, uh, but the point is that um, we went far, it worked, we started getting, and, and the, the indicators when you're very small scale, you have no traffic, for example, trying to decide whether something is working or not working in a consumer business can be very challenging. So I didn't tell you that we almost folded the company in the first month of our existence because there were no sales whatsoever for the first month. And then uh, it's a long story. Actually, I, I didn't know that. Let's go into that. You want to go? Okay. Yes, yes, please. Okay. So the, the, the first month we launched, we had zero sales. Very different from Eve.com mm -hmm. where immediately people started streaming and buying makeup from us like in, a, mm -hmm. in kind of a surprising fashion. Okay. Um, no sales. Not a single one maybe week number six, we had one sale, one transaction. And um, what the transaction was, was nobody was buying any of the branded stationary products that we'd spent probably 90% of our funding launching because our investors thought that would be a little safer, which I understand. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And there were 22 designs that were crowdsourced for save the date card invitations. I don't know if you guys even know what those are, but those are wedding, like uh -huh. you send a save the date card out when you are, get engaged and you're about to get married. So that, um, that um, 22 of those designs, they started selling. So there's this tiny sign of life in this tiny little corner, one transaction a week. Then there were two, then maybe two another week, and then three. And the question was, we, we, the problem is we had no traffic, so we had no ability to, to, to tell whether that was good or bad, except mm -hmm. you know, the conversion rate was 0.1%, which is pretty lousy, of, of unique visitors, uh, transactions divided by unique visitors. right? So you want to get a conversion rate at least up to 1% or higher, really, yep. to, to be a healthy e-commerce business. Um, so um, I thought to myself, geez, maybe I should just take all the money and give it back to my friends. They're all my friends who angel invested. I'm feeling very responsible. I can't take two and a half million from my friends and burn it. And, and honestly, the, the, re the reason I kept going, com just completely honestly, was I did not want to lose my friends' money. I felt uh -huh. so responsible uh -huh. for taking my friends' money that I just could not lose their money. Yeah, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to make it work. I don't care what happens. I've got to make it work. Mm -hmm. And that means I'm going to take a venture round. Uh -huh. So that's why I took the venture <laughs> round. So I, I took the venture round in 2008, the first round, right a couple weeks before Lehman failed. Um, uh, you have some good timing, by the way. <laughs> do not watch me carefully. Do not watch me. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to be watched about this. But yes, um, I, I, you know, uh, well, in this particular case, one of my angels called and said, "I have a really bad feeling." This is August 2008. Mm -hmm. I have a really bad feeling. I really think you should raise some money to save the company. I said, "I think you're right, Alex." Mm -hmm. This is my uh, friend Alex Lusky, who runs Vector, and he. Um, I quit my vacation from flew down from where I was in Seattle and then raised money from IDG. And, mm -hmm. and then literally, I, I was saying to the lawyers, 
I got a bad feeling. We got to close this. We got to close it. And then two weeks later. By the way, just so you don't feel like you're completely unique in this. Yes. Uh, uh, two parts of my own personal history in this. So PayPal uh, raised $100 million on a 500 pre with no revenue in 2000. And we closed the day that NASDAQ peaked. Oh, no. Right. <laughs> right. That's fantastic. So, and this was Peter's genius, not mine, Peter Thiel. Because Peter, I, there was so much interest that there was, um, there were some international folks who were deducing our bank, because this was the crazy, you remember the first boom, um, uh, uh, they, they were deducing our bank account, wiring us $10 million, and then telling us because we had the money already, we had to let them into the round. Oh, That's wow. how crazy it was. Wow. Right? And you're like, what? You nice. wired us money from overseas? And you think that this is about the lot of invest? Now, I was amongst everyone else and telling Peter that, uh, like, well, well, shoot, if we have that much interest, we should just, you know, like raise more money and raise around. And Peter was like, no, this is crazy. This is a sign that everything is totally insane. Mm -hmm. We're closing, we're closing, we're closing, we're closing, we're closing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. And so, and, yeah. you know, he, you know, like, th that is, you can't get that real perfect timing. There's luck in that. Mm -hmm. But, oh, my gosh, that was the, you know, yeah. that was yeah. the beginning. Scary. The other one is also 2008. Um, early in 2008, uh, David Z at Greylock, mm -hmm. you know, uh, came to me, was on my board at LinkedIn and said, my partners and I have been talking, this is one of the actually functions and values of a venture firm, and say, we think the market's unstable. We don't mm -hmm. really know what it is, what's going to go on. They didn't like say, oh, we predict, predict it's a failure in credit default swaps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But like, things are overheated. Um, you should seriously consider doing a round as insurance. And we raised around entirely on insurance basis mm. in 2008 or so. It was our series, you know, D for mm -hmm. LinkedIn. That's great. Very, very similar kind of story. And by yeah. the way, that's, you know, part of one of the general scale-up strategies, sometimes associated with blitz scaling and otherwise, is to actually do that kind of capital planning, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you might say, look, I, I may not absolutely need this money right now, but I may need it intensely. Yeah. And so, like, now is a good time to get it. Right. And it always takes you more money and more time than you thought to do a lot, to do a lot of things, right? Yes. To do your plans. So, yeah. So we almost closed the company down, but we managed to. I, I just stuck with it, just out of sheer uh, commitment to my friends. So, yeah. did the idea for doing the crowd network come as an experiment in the beginning, or was that what you wanted to do when your investors persuaded you to do the branding thing? I really wanted to go do completely crowdsourcing, oh. uh, but I was. I made the decision myself to yeah. be balanced because I was being counseled and to yeah. be, you know, let's be careful. Mm -hmm. So, and I, and I willingly made the decision myself. Yeah. Um, uh, th I'm so glad that we did it though, because it saved the company. And yeah. we did this, co we, we then had to go jettison all the brand relationships we had built. So we yeah. signed up all these brands for the, for exclusive yes. distribution yep. and then had to have the courage to go face all of them and say, oops, sorry, we made a mistake. We can't sell any of your products, it turns out, at all. <laughs> yes. And instead, we're going to go completely compete with you and source all these crowdsourced designs. Yes. And, and, and not only that, but the, the reason why all these people are entering in the competitions to begin with is because you are here with us right now. Um, <laughs> Thanks for that. And, and it was terrible. I felt really terrible yeah, about it. Yeah. And so, because um, that's what created its aspiration for all of these wannabe designers yeah. to come in because we had all these fantastic brands signed up. Right. In the beginning, because it's the brand, it's set the brand thing for people to say this is a good competing thing. in this competition is worth something. Is worth something exactly. So, um, is there a different way you would hack that now? If you were to call your younger self, would you, would you, with all the regrets and everything else, play the same path, or would you do it differently? I would feel ethically I have a hard time doing uh -huh. it, knowing what happened. Yeah. That I wouldn't have planned it that way, and yeah. I would have a hard time doing mm -hmm. that now. But. Um, I think there are ways you can hack around that, by, yeah. but, but the key thing is you need to build aspiration for people. Yep. And um, you, there are other ways to build aspiration. Yep. Um, so um, with the community, you had asked me a question though about scaling. Yep. It turns out that uh, we have not had to do, you know, we've had to have make smart and very consistent and fair, fair uh, policies to our community. We don't change them. We don't change, go back on the community members ever. Mm -hmm. We have very, very strict policies about like not going back on people. Communication is very consistent and clear, those kinds of things. But we've not, we've not had to invest money in the community. And so in the art business, just an example, uh, we didn't add anybody to our business for two and a half years in, in the art business. Um, 
we just let the community build up over time and create all the content. Mm -hmm. And then slowly as the content grew, conversion rates went up and the business um, grew you know, to basically a um, uh, eight figure business in you know, two and a half years mm -hmm. with, with like actually hiring nobody at the company at all. So community can be a great leverage point if you can let people make decisions outside the company, mm -hmm. if you can build a community and transfer entire functions essentially mm -hmm. to the community. Our whole product design arm is really our community of people uh -huh. who don't work for us directly. Uh -huh. uh, you, well, you know so much about that. Uh, you know, that, that can be a huge, um, it's a huge lever point. I mean, we, can, we just launched, uh, if you go to our site and you go to the participate section, um, one week ago we launched an outdoor art challenge. So we are decorate because our landlord in San Francisco asked us he, he loves what we did on the inside of the building. <laughs> so he's asked us to decorate the outside of the building. So uh -huh. we now have a challenge going right now to decorate the outside of 747 front. Uh -huh. um, so it's, um, it's really quite amazing what a community of, uh, will do if you manage it with the core, mm -hmm. core consistent practices. Are you familiar with Hayek? No. Uh, anyway, there's, Hayek? Hayek. He's an he's a Austrian economist who won the Nobel Prize. Oh, Hayek. Oh, yes, yeah. Yes, okay, yes. sorry. Oh, Did you deliberately design the community rules in a kind of a rule of law Hayekian fashion? Mm, <laughs> no, but I think that they think of it as a society, uh -huh, yeah. a, a separate society which has developed, a, has, has, has demonstrated a lot of... Um, characteristics of an actual real life civilization mm -hmm. in, the, in the real world. For example, people are constantly striving to climb ladders in our mm -hmm. society, in our minted yeah. society. Yep. They're never happy being at a wrong. They're always looking for the next mm -hmm. wrong. It's very, very interesting. People, people don't want it to be flat at all. Mm -hmm. they, yep. they, don't want, they, want, they don't want communism mm -hmm. in our society. They mm -hmm. want this hierarchy. There are all kinds of interesting things that we've observed. Yes. Well, community. this is part of how your community is actually different than Mozilla and Code for America, which is part of last week. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? Interesting. And so you're, yeah. you actually have the commercial community as a, as a representative. Yeah. Um, what did you learn about the building of that community network mm -hmm. such that you would go, oh, I doubled down on that. That was something that was really important. Someone else trying to build a community like this is something you should think about. And also, that those are positive lessons. And the negative lessons, like, oh, if I could call myself yeah. earlier, I'd say, oh, don't do that one or do it less or differently. The positive lessons have been to go really slowly. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no rush to change policies. For example, um, we started very conservatively with commissions mm -hmm. because we figured looking at eBay and some of the things that happened at eBay when they tried to bring commissions down, we thought, well, there's only one way to go, which is up. You, you don't want to go back, you don't want to reduce commissions on people. Mm -hmm. So let's start very conservatively and then move up slowly over time. Mm -hmm. So we liked, that's served us well. Okay. Um, Consistently trying to emphasize fairness and mm -hmm. good treatment of people has been hu has been enormous for us because the word of mouth mm -hmm. yep. among designers has been very strong. Yep. Um, one thing I noticed early was I read that book uh, Blink by um, I'm sorry uh, uh, sorry I'm getting this completely wrong I'm sorry no no sorry I apologize I apologize um, there's a book by uh, Daniel Pink called. Um, Drive, thank you, yeah. sorry, drive. And it is, uh, talks about how money can be a real, uh, sap, it can sap the true energy of a community and of mm -hmm. a society, the discussion around money. Mm -hmm. And I uh, made an early mistake where um, having looked at Mary Kay and Avon, I thought, okay, commissions have just come in, so-and-so has made this much money, mm -hmm. why don't we do what Mary Kay and Avon do and, and celebrate the person who made the most money at the end of the holiday quarter Mm -hmm. um, and write a letter to the community and say, so-and-so made this much money. Isn't mm -hmm. that a great celebration? Because, mm -hmm. you know, in, at the conferences in direct sales, they'll get the top seller up on mm -hmm. the stage and celebrate, maybe a pink Cadillac, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, we had a very Second negative reaction. Steak knives, but yes. Steak knives. Yes. <laughs> um, Sorry, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. There's a, <laughs> old, there's a movie, it's... it's the classic sales movie: first prize Cadillac, second prize steak knives, third prize you're fired. <laughs> okay, I have to, I have to, I have to watch that again. <laughs> yes. Um, so we did that. We had a huge negative reaction. People um, started quitting the community after we sent that email out. They started stopped participating. I can never be as good as that person. I'm, no, I'm, I'm never going to earn that much money. We had all kinds of interesting reactions, mm -hmm. and especially people focused more on money than on anything else. Mm -hmm. When we moved it away to personal growth, hmm. to uh, learning, because people com uh, communicate with each other mm -hmm. and critique each other, mm -hmm. and that's a key principle of what we provide is er er education and learning. Mm -hmm. um, 
we moved it into a better place. So we looked at all the incentives and we don't really talk about money very often. We don't say, mm. you're gonna quit your day job, you know, because what an expectation to build that you can't uh, ever live up to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so we talk about things that we know we can live up to. Um, you, will, you, will, you will get great critique and education from this community. Your brand will be built mm. by us. Um, you will have fun in the game. We'll, pl we'll play a game that's really fun. This is a fun game to play. Mm -hmm. There'll be a fun reward, set of rewards. Um, you'll make friends, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. And we talk about money way last. And that was mm -hmm. one mistake I made early that I thought was kind of an interesting learning. Yeah, yeah no, uh, especially given the commercial community. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you reconcile the whole hierarchy of community mm -hmm. that you were at earlier point together with this no, I don't want the pink Cadillac grand prize sort of thing where I'm measuring myself there. How does, how does that play? Um, I think people, um, they, they want to know that they're just making progress in life. Mm. So I'm not sure I would, I think the progress can come in many forms. Mm. It could be, you know, um, you're going to include me in the catalog mm. in, 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 or in the, some marketing vehicle. Mm -hmm as easily as it could be, uh, I've earned it my way into a higher level of commission. Uh -huh. So I think that you can build hierarchy, even frankly getting a phone call, believe it or not, with the Minted team mm -hmm. is seen as a treasure because mm -hmm. you might get some interesting insight or critique on your work that, that you really want. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of other incentives that you can provide other than directly money that can create a sense of uh, progress, mm -hmm. continued forward progress. The human wants to make continued forward progress, it turns out, yes. <laughs> um, which is that. a great thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. so um, nobody is satisfied doing the same thing again and again, I think. So. And, and, and before we get Stay back to the place. scale thing, there's one other kind of technical thing. Here's, do you ever recurse at all? Like, do you ever have the minted community create things that are essentially the status markers or the progress markers that you then hand out to the minted community as part of what you're doing. Mm, interesting. Um, we do have uh, uh, positive comments that come, f we, that we allow oh. the community to give to each other that mm -hmm. result in certain awards. Mm -hmm. For example, the most helpful. Mm -hmm. The most helpful, the most helpful commenter in the community, for example, is elected by the community members uh -huh. and then that person receives other rewards. So we're starting to have, we're starting to have, we so don't have that fully built out. So you have some stuff where by people are saying and these kinds of things, it's completely community controlled. Is the recognition also an artifact designed by the minted community? It is not, but uh, it probably should be. Uh, yeah, we need okay. to take more and push yeah, it out. Yeah. I just want to keep pushing stuff completely out of the decisions more and more out of yeah. the community. But all the policing, for example, happens in the community. We don't pay any money to anyone to, to police bad behavior yep. because the community continuously reports on bad behavior to us. So, so. they report. Do they act or do you act? Um, <clears throat> sometimes they take matters into their own hands and uh -huh. it's vigilante justice, uh -huh. uh, but it's, uh, you know, they'll leave comments to each other uh -huh. that are not that great. Uh -huh. uh, but they try to be, overall, it's a pretty polite community uh -huh. yeah. um, and supportive. Uh, so they oftentimes would prefer so we do like it. like neighborhood watch. Neighborhood watch. Yes. Yeah, okay, not it. complete vigilanteism, yes. <laughs> so um, now get to scaling the community. Has, mm -hmm. has, and this is fantastic, it worked out this way. Did it just grow on its own? Or were there anything that you actually specifically had to do in order to grow it? And was there anything you did to try to accelerate that growth or otherwise mm -hmm. kind of fill out to get to critical mass successfully? So we did go to a trade show at one point in the very early days and we did mail the mailing list of the trade show. <laughs> so we did do that. I think we did it once, maybe twice. Um, and then we thought, geez, we have way too many entrants into these competitions. You know, we're gonna start turning too many people away because ours is a curated marketplace. We are curated, not everybody gets to sell on Minted. Right? It's only what gets voted in. So um, we stopped recruiting because we thought we were turning away too many people. Um, the other kind of surprise was um, consumer marketing. So in our attempt to build an aspirational brand for consumers, we ended up attracting in a lot of designers, actually. So mm -hmm. the surprise was how many artists we actually attract because of our consumer marketing yeah. and making that really attractive, essentially, but brought in people who are very design savvy. Yeah. Um, and then all kinds, and then the other thing I want to say is that the creative, who is a creative in the US or really globally right now is completely changing. So that was a complete, that was a surprise. Mm. I thought that there would be trained stationary designers entering our competitions. Mm. Actually, it turns out that there were people approaching us at meetups and saying, you know, I have a confession to make. I've never been 
formally trained. I taught myself how to design in Microsoft Word. Or um, I'm a plumber. I, I met a plumber last week uh -huh. at, in New York, and she's one of the three female master plumbers in New York City. Her yeah. grandfather was a plumber. Her father's a plumber. She is a plumber, uh -huh. and she enters minted champ champ competitions, and she wins, and she beats people who have uh, art degrees from uh -huh. really nice universities. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, what's happening right now is a tip of an iceberg as to uh -huh. all the creative talent that hi is hidden everywhere in, in, right now in this society, either because people were told not to pursue creative careers, they didn't have the money to, to get an education or the tools. That's changing now because of visual, social, uh, media platforms, as well as access to tools, um, and people are now uh, expressing themselves. And uh -huh. so, that the, who is a creative, and what the creative economy uh -huh. is going to be, is going to be completely different. Yeah, creative cu uh, culture and class, and all these things. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and the Hobbyist. meritocracy that comes from a network. It's yeah, great stuff. Yeah, but literally, actually, in fact, on the growth side of it, you just you hit the oil well. Yep, and the oil well goes. Yes, we never really had to do anything after mm -hmm. that because the. Um, Designers would tell each other, you've really got to submit to Minted. So there was a yeah. word of mouth network that started happening and that we were good to work with. Yeah. And on the other hand, the consumer marketing started attracting a lot of designers in, yeah. and then we never really had to recruit again. Yeah. When we went into art, the one mm -hmm. exception I will make is with art, we did um, approach a few artists in the very, very early mm -hmm. days to submit. Mm -hmm. And we did do a, a little bit of work recruiting maybe something like 30 to 50 people. Right. Once the West Elm deal kicked in, and West Elm was promoting minted art, because yeah, you're bringing you're bringing the buyers, you're bringing the already people who are curating this, and so uh, so people who are producing it want to get into those channels. And we brought more credibility because West yeah. Elm was seen as credible. So yes. all of a sudden, it was more of the same thing that started the community, which was credibility that uh -huh. builds an aspiration that builds more community. All right, so let's shift to scaling the organization. Mm -hmm. So now you you know uh, you've raised. A more substantial thing, you say, okay, I actually, in fact, have to raise executives and pay them and all the rest of this stuff. Uh, what have been the key lessons for now that you're scaling Minted? And it's different than Eve, where Eve was like classic internet boom. Oh my gosh, you know, there's there are competitors that are exactly like me, just a little bit behind me. I need to out execute them, outspend them. Yeah. I just need to go like the Dickens. Here I can build out a little bit more deliberately, but I am building to try to achieve a higher growth scale. What are the things that have worked? What are the things you're thinking about? What are the things you're trying? Yeah. Well, the one of the most fascinating things is if you're just around long enough, mm -hmm. you can you start to realize that you can grow people within the company, but you need years and years to do that, mm -hmm. to grow people into leaders. Um, and then you realize, wow, wasn't I, what you think, it, it, it feels like it was a smart strategy, but all you had to do was like be around long enough mm -hmm. because essentially if you can look for people's unique talents and then, um, and, and grow people from within, those people will become, I think, I, I believe now the strongest leaders you you have, uh, mm -hmm. some of, some of them will, um, we have tried to combine a portfolio, have a portfolio strategy. So we take um, disciplines where we are not experts, like finance, HR, where people do mm -hmm. uh, do things better than we do, mm -hmm. and we hire those people from outside. Uh, the things that we do that are differentiated and where our secret sauce lies, for example, crowdsourcing instead of mm -hmm. traditional merchandising, we grow people from the inside. Mm -hmm. Because it's very hard to take, let's say, a merchant from, let's say, Gap, and say, mm -hmm. we want you to unlearn everything you've learned for the past 25 years mm -hmm. and not believe in it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to completely break you down yes. <laughs> and build you back up again. So it's, it's, that is a lot harder than to take a person, let's say a very smart person, build them up uh, inside the company mm -hmm. uh, and build them into a leader. So we've done that with um, our GM of art, our GM of stationery, are both mm -hmm. general managers are both grown within the company. Yep. Um, and uh, we've hired the chief people officer and the VP of finance from outside the company, for example. And what are the ways that you try to help them scale as executives? What are the techniques for that? Because that's actually part of the whole scale up yeah. challenge when you're doing that particular approach. It is really hard. If you have no, um, in the beginning, one of the worst parts was that uh, uh, capital affects culture uh -huh. in that um, with very little capital, um, you end up having no, uh, like basically no bench. Mm -hmm. So if you have no bench, you can't hold people accountable and you can't 
you, 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 very, you, you, you basically, um, it's hard to let people fail when your bottom mm -hmm. line is, you're so close to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So if, essentially, if you have very little capital and you can't make any mistakes, it's very hard to let people fail and grow on their own. Mm -hmm. With more capital, you can actually let some of those mistakes happen and your cash won't go to zero, basically. But we were for seven years, we're on this verge constantly of running out of cash for like a, yep. for seven years. Yep. And um, that was a very tough place to be to let people make mistakes. So I, I few thought- Few more gray hairs. Was that? Few more, for gray, you more gray hairs. Definitely. Yeah. So I mean, I, I thought of it as a time where we were doing too much micromanagement and not enough you know, open, sort of like let people make mistakes, let people grow, et cetera. Now what we can do is let people grow, make mistakes, we do make, let them, th th that's much more possible now. Mm -hmm. um, we also hire uh, advisors from the outside mm -hmm. using usually equity to mm -hmm. bring in um, some experienced people to help advise yep. said, you know, grown from within out executives. Uh -huh. So we do have somebody who's very senior from retail right now uh -huh. who's yep. in advising the two GMs, yep. um, providing another alternate yep. opinion to mine. Yep, that's a classic so, actually pattern for the Silicon Valley yep. uh, scale up because it's like, okay, how do we use a network to identify the key people to help grow the people within the team yep. in order to get to that? Yep. Because classically, if you're doing a disruptive business, the go recruit someone who is an expert in retail doesn't actually, well, they're not expert in this. They're an expert in that game. This game is, the whole reason this game's working is it's a new game. It's a different right, game. Right, exactly. Different success <laughs> metrics. Yeah. So how do you get the advice in order how to learn the skills that are critical and building up afresh. That's a, yeah. that's a canonical pattern that's actually very good. Good. I'm, yeah. glad, we're do I'm glad we're doing the right thing. <laughs> I'm trying to think of other ways we've helped people scale. Um, we tried to do peer feedback. So we have gone through coaching to allow each other, basically encourage people to hold each other accountable. So I don't know if you guys have read the five dysfunctions of, of uh, the, the five dysfunctions book by Lencioni, but we really, we've all read that together. We went to a coaching session together, and we've tried to like basically have peers hold peers accountable, uh -huh. yep. which is one of the hardest things to do yep. in an environment where everyone's very collaborative and um, they all want to maintain very good relationships with when each other. When did you start that? We just started that last. Well, no, actually, the beginning of this year, and we hit. So we're about 150 people at the beginning of this year, uh -huh. and we and we had finally hired the executive team uh -huh. yep. <laughs> after many years. Um, and uh, went on, hired a coach. Yep. Um, so this is all part of the scale-up plan. This, this is, is definitely, yeah, yeah, trying to get people yes. to bond, have a create this yep. sense of a first team, yep. meaning first team principles is your, is your peer group at the executive level. Yep. And then being able to hold people accountable, each other. Yep. Have, so the CEO should not no longer be really the, the, the only one delivering all the bad news and the sort of holding people accountable. The idea is that the team can ma help manage each other. Yep. Right. So that's another thing. Yep. Well, that's kind of classic scale-up plan. It's also part of the key thing that I think all scale-ups need to do is just culture, mm -hmm. right? Which is how do you establish a culture that will actually preserve yes. as you're going? Yes, Is actually, in fact, really key. And so it's like, okay, let's do that as well. Um, so let's shift a little bit to your role mm -hmm. and how your role started mm -hmm. and changed. Mm -hmm. now, obviously, you know, seven years of staying very close to, yeah. you know, above the, uh, you know, uh, just profitable enough uh, means that, you know, uh, tremendous in the details on everything yep. in order to make it work. And every fire is a fire that lands on your desk. Yep. So at the beginning, how did you triage fires? Because there's too many. Yeah. So how did you kind of go, all right, these ones I let burn, these ones I I deal with. And are there any yeah. particular interesting examples? Um, yeah, in the beginning, I knew everything about every, everything that was going on at the company. And I think one of the biggest adjustments now is being okay actually not knowing everything that was going on at your company. It's a uh -huh. very weird, disconcerting feeling for somebody who's very detail-oriented. Yep. Um, in terms of triaging in the beginning, it was all about revenue growth, revenue growth, and revenue growth. It was very <laughs> revenue-oriented because mm -hmm. we, were, we had no cash, right? Yep. So it was very quantitatively based yep. in terms of we'd rank our initiatives, figure out what would drive revenue growth and go down the list. I yep. mean, it was very like focused on that uh -huh. yep. um, whilst not building, while not damaging the brand. Yep. So, and, and by the way, mm -hmm. uh, just for the class basis, part of the whole scale up thing is you have to be, the fundamental strategy layer is managing capital. So you either have to be having a financing plan, and some companies do this mm -hmm. through a successive set of financings, mm -hmm. and they're planning what their next financing is going as they're doing it, or you have to be managing this cash. But if you're not managing the financial uh, strategy as fundamental, you can't get to product strategy, you can't get to product distribution strategy, right. et cetera. So, yeah. yeah. So, so in the early days, my role was very much about capital, ac yeah. acquiring capital, making sure the product was working very well, yep. 
and hiring, basically. Yep. And I was trying to think about this mm -hmm. <laughs> over the weekend, which is, has anything changed? I'm still thinking about capital. I'm still yeah. thinking about product. I'm still thinking about strategy, um, about uh, hiring. Uh, and um, I would say I've just layered more things on, frankly, mm -hmm. as the company's gotten more complex. Have you changed the way you're thinking about them? Yes. Um, so now, for example, I, in the beginning, I was very much involved with our go-to-market monetization strategy, which is how to get sales going. I was super mm -hmm. involved in marketing. Within two to three years, I was no longer involved in marketing, and I'm very not involved in marketing right now. For example, I'm not. Yeah. I'm more involved on the product side, on strategy. Um, you know, we we growth companies get hungry, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we we're looking we're looking for constant areas of growth. We're hungry mm -hmm. companies, mm -hmm. and so you what happens is you, you basically get your product strategy. You break. You do product market fit. You've got your you do your revenue scaling. You figure out how to get your revenue uh, to continue going without you doing it, mm -hmm. and then you make your life more complicated because you might look for growth avenues, and that could be either going to different geographies, or you could be going for us into different verticals. So we mm -hmm. made our lives more complicated, looking for more adjustable market size um, to attract capital, to attract people, and basically to fulfill our mission of making everything in the world really well designed because mm -hmm. we really think that everything in our customers lives can be more beautiful and better designed over time but yeah so um to answer i guess to answer your question the role um has changed because i basically try there are many many areas that i do not manage directly at all mm -hmm. we set objectives we manage by numbers and mm -hmm. i look at the numbers and basically it's very by creating very very um uh, succinct and repetitive dashboards, mm -hmm. frankly, that we look right. at every Monday. You can tell when something is going wrong or not, and then if something's going wrong, then you can go dive deep. You strike me as a numbers person. You probably created those dashboards dashboards earlier than most entrepreneurs. Yeah. yeah. Myself, yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, because the, the thing with Eve.com back way back yeah. when was that there, were, there was nobody to make dashboards, so you had to mm -hmm. sit there with a blank piece of paper and think, now what metrics should I invent to manage an e-commerce business? Uh -huh. and, like you had to do everything completely from scratch yourself on a blank sheet. So I got really into managing and building dashboards and metrics. I, it's one of my favorite, mm. absolute favorite things to do. I know it sounds crazy, but I love building dashboards, uh -huh. like metrics. And um, I find that now it's a way of teaching people. So I, now I think about d analytics at the company as a key way of leveraging myself and creating reports for other people to transfer knowledge to other people who are burgeoning GMs. Yep. So, yeah. so you're naturally that way, but that is actually one of the also classic kind of blitzscaling techniques is you have to actually begin to start uh, putting metrics and dashboards at the center of your management chain and your cross communication and collaboration train. Yes. And there's dangers to that too, right? Because if you have the wrong dashboard, mm -hmm or too many things, or there's metrics that people are tracking that are not actually, in fact, the strategic metrics. Right. That can actually create dysfunction as well as function. Yeah. Any particular historical back looks yes. at, at great function and dysfunction through the creation of? Well, the key thing is to create really consistent questions from the very beginning and do not change those questions over time because you need the year-over-year -year history and you need that record to be sacrosanct. Like, do not touch the history and don't change the questions every year. So, for example, um, We've been tracking our NPS score and asking the same exact questions since July of 2008. Just in case, I Sorry. suspect everyone knows no, what NPS score apologize. is, but just, no, 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 just in case. Net promoter score, it's basically, will your uh, customers refer uh, your product or service to other people? And it's a, it's a way, it basically, when uh, business school profs, I think, I think it came out of Wharton, but I'm not exact, I don't know which yeah. group it actually came out of, but when, when they did an analysis about how you analyze how, ultimately happy your customers are with you, a lot of them all correlated with your NPS score. So it makes it much simpler in order to do something. Yeah, exactly. And so um, we, um, we put into place, there are two, basically we are, um, the, the things that I have not let go of, just I'm gonna circle back to analytics, yeah, yep. are analytics, yep. <laughs> customer, look, reading customer feedback and talking to customers directly, getting yeah. the primary information versus secondary information. Um, Brand, community, strategy. You Every said you're not doing much in marketing, but you just said you're holding on to brand. 
Brand um, expression, but not yeah. acquisition strategy, yeah. traffic generation, driving revenue, but actually the brand, like what are the, what's the brand expression? Yeah. The yeah. creative expression of the brand. Um, the, uh, but not operations anymore. I used to run customer service. I do not do that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, By the way, the most hardcore one of that, yeah. have you ever met Paul English who did kayak? He's out in Boston. No. He put his cell number as the customer service. Oh my God, wow. Yeah, that's that, was bold. The hard, that's that, was bold. The, that was the hardest core one of that I've heard. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So we, we are very, very, uh, we're very customer centric as the yeah. customer service oriented, but I, I would, you know, manage a lot of shifts and basically manage customer service for a couple of years during the holiday season, which I would not wish on anybody. Um, it, was, it was a great learning experience, but glad it's not me anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, the key thing with analytics I heard uh, of it yeah, on yeah. learning experiences. That's usually the dot dot dot. Glad it's not me anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's it's fantastic <laughs> because there's no, there's nothing that can that can substitute having that experience. I think, mm -hmm. but um, for us at least, we built these uh, built key metrics early and did not change them, and were rigorous about tracking them at a regular pace every Monday morning. Every Monday, we we mm -hmm. produce our dashboards. They're rigorous. They they go out regularly. Yeah. It's a process that people follow. Um, do you have a staff sit down with the numbers? We do. We have a yep. sales meeting every Monday. Um, and the on the research side, we we believe both in the sort of qualitative talk to the customers to, to interpret things you can't get through the numbers mm -hmm. and then take those hypotheses that come out of that and then test them through large scale, like SurveyMonkey. Mm -hmm. SurveyMonkey, I, I, I could be a... Com I, I, I have built so much of our business using SurveyMonkey. Mm -hmm. um, I could go on forever on Professor Monkey. We'll be here in a couple weeks. Okay, well, uh -huh. we have really uh, significantly impacted our business by uh -huh. using SurveyMonkey to intuit new products, to figure out what people. Th I mean, you, you wouldn't believe how much we built. Are you in how you developed the initial kind of stationary contests and everything else that you would change different, like you would change when you look back? Um, I. Add. Subtract. There's probably a ton of things I would have liked to have engineering capacity to build, uh, right. and I probably really underfunded the business, frankly. I probably mm -hmm. was a little conservative, honestly. Mm -hmm. I think it was a little bit, though, influenced by wanting to not get diluted ownership-wise, mm -hmm. and then also worried about, um, you know, just the outcome, you know, was I going to get forced down the path of taking the company public, or what was mm -hmm. going to happen? I didn't want to, I didn't, I wanted to have control over the outcome, at yep. least a little bit of control. Um, but I did underfund the company, and I probably should have used engineering time to build more features into the into the game earlier. Yep. Um, so um, I, I would I would have done that. I would have done that yeah. a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask two of the questions that were submitted. I have a. If it gives you a sense of how many more questions I have, a stack of questions I haven't gotten to, <laughs> but I'm going to also open it up to questions from the audience in case you guys have specifics that are coming out here. And if not, that's fine. I've got plenty right, to go through. Um, uh, you know, and one of the things that's uh, um, from Andrei Payankov, I'm really terrible with names. Actually, I, had a, I used to always announce my superpower is I'm terrible at pronouncing names from written form. Um, what are some of the important characteristics of the independent artist community which enabled building a successful marketplace? And also correlated, what one what should one consider when evaluating a market as a candidate for building a marketplace business? Okay, I'll take the second one first. Okay. So, um, when you're when you're if you have a product that can benefit from, benefit from a lot of diversity, so there's a long tail of demand. That's mm -hmm. a good one. So you you know, diversity of variety should make a difference in this market. Mm -hmm. Another one is there's enough room in the product to have variety express itself. Mm. Um, another one is um, hits are important. The more important get, getting the hit, identifying the hit is, so let's say you're in the music business and you absolutely have to know that one hit because the hit's gonna do mm. a huge, so like on the other hand, so, so on the one hand you want, a, you want to have a lot of diversity because you can get a nice long tail. On the other hand, if a hit is important in any way, I can I can net it through the curation process through voting. Mm -hmm. So I, I like having I like having both aspects. But I do think in in the end, having the long tail um, is more important um, than the um, uh, a lot of talent, a lot of people to to a lot of people mm -hmm. who can transact as suppliers. Mm -hmm. 
um, is important. So uh, if we did something where there were very few artisans mm -hmm. in that in that uh, profession or in that in the area, it would be hard. Mm -hmm. So you need to have enough enough talent. Yep. Yeah. So uh, from Deanna, uh, uh, but this is okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like I said, super su super weakness. Um, how have you seen the conversation around diversity shift or not since you first came to Silicon Valley? What would be the most impactful actions for individuals or companies to take to promote more diversity? Mm. And add to that, what, what kind of advice would you give for women entrepreneurs? Okay. Um, well, first, uh, advice for women entrepreneurs would be to start as early as possible because you do have a shorter runway before life starts to um, sort of present trade-offs. Let me put it that way. Um, family, for example. So I would take more risk as a female rather than less risk. I think women should be encouraged to take far more risk than men, actually, because mm -hmm. the time runway is so short. Mm -hmm. um, and I accidentally discovered that and benefited from it <laughs> because I was able to afford a nanny and you know all this yeah. other stuff. I could, you know, I had a great, I had the great negotiating leverage after the first one, uh -huh. so the first company. Um, the other thing um, I would I would advise is actually to get male mentors, not just female mentors. Everyone's like, oh, you need a female mentor. Well, actually, if most people who are in positions of decision-making authority are male, you actually need a male mentor and male friends to help you. And luckily, um, I'm happy to say that uh, despite everything that's being reported out there, that most people are actually open-minded, it turns out. Um, and the bad ones get a lot of the press, but the good ones don't. And there are a lot of good people to help you. And a lot of the, I mean, I would say almost everybody who's helped me has been male. Um, uh, you know, and the generation behind me is actually even more, uh, you know, enlightened than my generation, which is great. So I have, um, you know, I, I really do believe that actually that the millennial generation is is more actually, oh, it, you know, it, 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 things get, just keep getting better. So By the way, just um, to clarify, because I think I I know you reasonably well, so I think yeah. there's a nuance in what you're saying that's yes. important. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have male mentors as well. You can also perfectly find. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes. No, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Let that, me make sure that's yes, very clear on yes. camera. I know you, so I wanted to make sure you knew. <laughs> so um, you do. Female mentors are important, but they're not the only yes. thing you should yeah. go find in terms yes. of mentors. You should yes. find male mentors as well. You, you yeah. need to have both. Um, and many of the people who have helped me really, uh, you know, gain financing and other access to other things have been male mentors and friends. Um, and then the diversity conversation, it has, things have shifted a lot uh, in that, in general, generational turnover creates more open-mindedness. It just happens. It's like just natural. You, you just wait it out and things will change. So, I mean, it's true. It, things are changing and people are acting on things. And, and, and you know, I, I look at some VC firms that never found, funded uh, female entrepreneurs. There are a couple, and then all of a sudden, they've got a couple of female entrepreneurs in their portfolio. So it's very mm -hmm. much uh, changing. People want to make money. And if you can provide results, and that's the key thing to focus on, uh, you know, that's the number one thing to focus on, they will go where the money is because they are business people <laughs> and they will want to make money on you. Essentially, so that's that would be my my number one piece of advice is focus on delivering the results, and everything else is going to follow mm -hmm. that. And try to like ignore all the, build your own company the way you want to build it with yeah. people you want to build it with. Focus yeah. on company building. Yeah, and get the right people inside your company who are open minded, and mm -hmm. it's not going to eventually be a problem for you. I think. So I'm going to ask one more question and then open it up. Like I said, I can continue. Mm -hmm. So on the goal of moving past the. Uh, a critical failure point of curation of like uh, for example like one purchaser who has to get it right this year have you successfully totally blown that out of the water are you part way down that sorry said so, so you know um, you you previously looked at these retail businesses and said you're 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 dependent on one taste oh yes yes uh -huh. okay? yep so is that proven done dead part of the past or is it still something that you're coming up to I'm feeling very, very confident about it now. Um, we have, let's say you have a, a set of bestsellers, right? That let's say in the, the traditional Pareto rule is there's an 80-20 rule, right? So 80% of your sales are, let's say, done by 20% of your assortment. Mm. So take that 80%, about 80% of that 80% is now ranking in the top 5% of our votes, mm -hmm. okay? Of our voted ranking and the way we apply analytics to voting. So we 
do some things to the votes to weight certain voters differently. Hmm. And those voters are what well, fit our predictive model. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so we can't talk about that. Please don't ask yes. me. Yes, um, no, but, no, uh, but I can't oh. talk about the specifics. But if I asked you, you could just say I can't answer. That's, That's true. Yes. I could, yeah. So, uh, but uh, we have certain characteristics that even if you've never voted for before, we can fit you to and profile you. We will then uh, weight your vote differently. And then based on that, we can now predict bestsellers. Do you do machine learning, intense data science? Not yet, but we're building, yeah. we're building analytics yeah. up right now. Yeah. So All I'm right. feeling good about that. Uh, so for the first 20 minutes that you raised back in 2000, what must you raise the you have to keep for that? And how did you like, first make that connection uh, to raise that money? In the, for the eve.com example, um, I just tried to network with Stanford. And, and repeat the question a little bit. Oh, I'm video. sorry. Yeah. The, the question was for the first company, eve.com, we raised 26 million. How did we network our way? How did we get an entree into that, raising that money? And uh, what was the monthly, did we have to make a certain monthly revenue? Back then, people were not focused at all on uh, you know, proving out the revenue or the profit. They just wanted us to go fast. And they were happy when we produced 10 million in the first year in revenue, but they were not asking for that at all. Um, now, for an e-commerce company, you probably want to show good traction, consumer traction, before you're going to get funded, I think, potentially, although he's more of an expert than I am on the funding. Um, on what the way we did, we, we basically, my partner was a, a, a HBS alum, and I was a GSP alum, and we just looked at our networks, and we tried to network our way to VCs, uh, you know, who would meet with us. And at that point, people were very interested in business school students raising money. Now the tide, and the tide just keeps shifting, the tide shifted more towards engineering and um, user experience designers. This so. is a CS undergraduate class. Perfect. You yes. guys are great. You guys are very well positioned, <laughs> way better positioned than an MBA. Back then it was like, oh, who, you know, who's the MBA who can write a business plan? In 98, that was, it's a very outdated model now. Now mm -hmm. it's um, who's the, the brilliant engineer paired with a great designer who could come forward. I don't know if, if that's true or not, yep. but yep. that's... Uh, you know, you could easily, it's a networking game, networking your way, getting introductions, because a lot of the um, VCs will meet with people who have been referred to them, yeah, referrals the, help. Just to amplify that, um, all the quality VCs get, call it minimum 10 to 20 cold pitches into their inbox per day, right? You can't even look at them, right? You just, like, it's, oh, I've got the best new app thing forever, and you're like, I just don't have time to process it. I don't have time to think about it. So the proxy that everyone uses is somebody who they trust says, take a look at this. Right? This, is, this person, this plan, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's always the way it works. Now, if you happen to be already so, throwing, showing so many points on the board where your traffic's really growing and else, they may reach out, they may look for you. If you say, look, this is what my baseline traffic is, they may forward it to an associate and say, take a look at this and see if this is not an assertion. Because by the way, a bunch of people send in lies too when they're doing this stuff, so it gets very hard to distinguish between signal and noise. So that's the reason why what Miriam is saying is essentially true. Now, on commerce, generally speaking, it either has to be traction, mm -hmm. obvious that you'll get traction, mm -hmm. or a clever enough plan mm -hmm. that you want, okay, this is an interesting gamble. Mm. Right? It has to be one of the three. Mm -hmm. In the back. So I was surprised to hear you say that you're tackling both digital and physical design simultaneously because a lot of companies have failed when they try to do both. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you thinking about that strategy and, and scaling both simultaneously? Yeah, yeah, we were. We're. It's a ner It's nerve wracking. We 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 spent. You know, we, we've been around now for eight years, and we finally are doing it. So we took a long time, right? So we one thing we did was we acquired a company in January that does wedding websites, that made wedding websites there in Kansas City, and we reskinned them completely with Minted, pushed all the community content through their platform, and that was a success. It's the product is launched, it, it's working beautifully. So we tried to buy one and start one, and we'll see. The story hasn't been told yet. I'm, you know, a couple months from now, I might be wishing I bought a digital invitations company too. Because um, it's a big learning experience for us. And S Selena from mm -hmm. SurveyMonkey mm -hmm. was previously at um, Evite mm -hmm. as their founding CTO. Mm -hmm. So we actually called we called her. Selena, yes. yeah. yeah, and and we are we. And you you're going to meet Selena. She's going to be here. It sounds like you'll meet her. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, uh, very carefully, I guess, is the answer, and with trepidation. Uh, great product, an awesome talk. So thank you. Um, so you kind of had a two front war when you were starting out. 
because you have both your artists who are producers and your buyers who are consumers, and you have to reach out to both of them, but you're only a small team. So as you were scaling up, how did you allocate resources? Such a great and insightful question because I felt like I was constantly running back and forth between the two audiences, myself personally, and I was trying really hard not to let... Um, you know, I, I've been mindful of reading about eBay and that they were focused, um, you know, too much on one, not on the other. Amazon was on, you know, one, not the other. And in the end, I felt like, in the end, if I could keep the de designer uh, experience simple, well run, and very, very ethical, that if I produced more revenue for the designers, that ultimately would would keep them with me long enough while I could get the capital to make their experience even better. So I bet on, you know, I, I, I would run back and forth. So I had to like do double duty, marketing, go to market strategy, run over to a meetup and make the designers happy, run back over to the marketing strategy, ready team, pop up the revenue, run back over, you know, back and forth, back and forth. I can say finally now today, I have a great community relations team who takes a lot of that community relations management off my hands. I'm still out there meeting with designers all the time in our community, like doing meetups, but I have a big... Uh, not, not big, but nice, very great team on community relations, and I've got a great team on marketing. But in the beginning, I had to do double duty and really run between the two audiences, and I tilted towards the consumer, thinking the more that I built the brand, the more aspirational I made the brand, and the bigger the revenue grew, the more of a virtuous cycle I would be um, providing f you know, to, to fuel c a community interest in Minted, because the bigger our revenue got, the more designers would be interested in us, essentially. So the classic question on this particular question, excellent question just really asked. Really good, yeah. Would, is there anything you would tell your, your earlier self to do differently <laughs> on the prioritization? I don't, I don't actually, I, I think given our capital strategy, mm -hmm. I, I would have just raised more capital earlier. Yeah, That's yeah. the only that, thing I would have done. And then everything else flows down. And I think that. everything would have yes. flown from there. We, yeah. we just bought a 3D printer and put one in our office to play with because I'm fascinated like what can I make out of this you know what can we do so I think it, I think it can be done I think you can crowdsource but you need to think about a fast fast to market I think you could do 3D but it, we are making pillows now on demand so we're making 3D things we're making, <laughs> we're making pillows on demand for consumers uh-huh oh. so our we we now make uh, but the, the the part that's crowdsourced is the surface material the tech the textile that's where all the goodness is. It's in the 2D printed uh, material that's just made into a couple of standard form factors. All right, so we're not trying to s source a different form factor design and then manufacture it, which would be really hard at scale. So um, it's threading the supply. If you're talking about products, it's threading this, this needle between um, enough differentiation from the actual crowdsourced content with a scalable supply chain and it's, that's fast to market. It's really a needle that you gotta thread. One last question. Is there another oh, one? Oh, we're good. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Please give Karen a hand. Thanks.